So today we're going to be taking a quick look at this here PIR sensor manufactured by HPM, specifically a XL632 model. Uh, this PIR sensor failed several years ago, so unfortunately I no longer have the plastic case it goes in, although I was able to find this here picture on the internet, although rather pixelated, it shows what it used to look like. In addition, I also found the original manual that it came with, and it's filled with all sorts of fantastic stuff such as this here usage artwork, as well as some quite useful information about how to use PRR sensors, as well as how to place them and what their sort of limitations are and what sort of loads you can and can't connect to it. So here's all of the internal circuitry from it that I kept, and we'll have a look at how it failed and how it failed in a not so nice way that came a little too close to maybe causing a fire. So first of all we can see that the PCB is split into two separate PCBs. The top one has all of the low voltage sensing circuitry including the actual PIR pyro element. And the other PCB has all of the power electronics including the power supply and whatever is switching the load. And of course clear as day we can see this here three pin cable between the two of them that certainly seen better days and was on the verge of catching fire, as well as this here power PCB that is heavily discolored. So taking a look at this here power PCB, we can see that there's all sorts of uh, power devices that you see in this sort of thing. We have this here TO220 device, which is a BTB08. This is a triac, which is what switches the load. It's a triac instead of a relay because these PIR sensors quite often turn on and off, so you want it to have a very long lifetime, and a relay, which is mechanical, doesn't last uh, as many cycles as a uh, triac. We also have a bridge rectifier here, as well as a rather large, maybe 2-3 watt uh, resistor next to it, so we can assume that this device uses a resistive dropper. There is an inductor, as well as a capacitor, However, these are just across mains as well as in series with the load, presumably to just come in compliance with EMI and RF emission requirements. There's also a whole heap of uh, transistors as well as capacitors and resistors splattered across the PCB. These are mostly just to drive the track by the looks of it, although I couldn't really be bothered to fully reverse engineer this thing. It's probably what they do. So taking a closer look at the discolored area of the PCB, we can see it's around the dropper resistor, and one of the leads has completely delaminated from the single-sided PCB, just completely lifting the pad. And this solder joint looks more like a cow pat than a solder joint. So I think it's uh, fair enough to say that this is where the uh, failure happened and it stopped working, because it's certainly been quite hot around here on this PCB, and we can also see that the other leg of this drop resistor has also started to lift off the PCB, as well as this here transistor, as well as all the way up the PCB over to here, between these two pins where another power resistor is. I'm not quite sure what this power resistor does, but it uh, looks to be a 1 watt resistor. By the way, these two resistors still measure their correct value as marked on their color codes. So we can assume that this high temperature, high dissipation is not a result of long-term use causing the resistance to drift, but is instead a, ooh, should I call it a design flaw that's caused too much dissipation, which this resistor really hasn't been able to dissipate correctly without damaging the PCB and surrounding components. Now, of course, I'm not going to attempt a repair on this sensor. It's really just not worth it. The PCB is quite badly damaged with all of this uh, heat exposure, as well as the fact this happened several years ago. The sensor has already been replaced. However, we can still tear it down and learn something from it. So let's take a look at the other PCB. This here is the cable that connects between the two of them. It's three conductors inside, and as you can see, it's quite heavily burnt. Presumably, this is just going to be ground power and the triac on-off. This thing doesn't do any sort of dimming. 
And here is, of course, the actual sensor PCB. There's actually quite a lot on here. We've got three uh, SOIC devices. First of all, we have a 27L2C, which is a low-power CMOS dual operational amplifier. We also have the Jelly Bean LM393 dual comparator. And of course, no design is complete without the ubiquitous 555 general purpose timer. And this PCB, of course, has a smattering of passives, such as resistors, capacitors, as well as some active transistors, some diodes, and well, that's it. There's no fancy microcontrollers on here. However, that's a rather surprising number of components for a PIR sensor these days. These days, you'll just see everything implemented in a single custom chip, as well as significantly fewer passives. I'll also mention that these uh, custom BISS chips meant for PIR sensors have also been reused for these fancy radar sensors that uh, sort of replace PIR sensors in certain applications. These BISS chips certainly weren't intended for this sort of application, but some rather fancy magic and wizardry has made this possible. And these things are rather impressive how they managed to get this all done for such a low cost. And of course, on the other side of this PCB is not much special. There's the electrolytic capacitors for timing and power supply regulation. There's these two potentiometers to set the time delay as well as the sensitivity. There's one of these cadmium sulfide photosensors for day-night sensing. But of course, there's also the pyroelectric sensor right here in this metal can. And that's actually why I'm making this video today, to take a closer look at these metal cans. There is actually quite a lot of information on the internet about these. Plenty of people will tell you how to use them, like Dave Jones from the EEV blog has a great video about how to use them and how they work, as well as Big Clive, who quickly brushes on how they work inside. However, I haven't found any good pictures or any good materials about exactly what's inside them and how it's all sort of constructed inside. So I want to take a closer look and actually open one of these up. First of all, just cut off the metal can from the PCB. We can just rip it off with some side cutters. Don't need to be careful about this PCB. And here is the actual sensor. It's marked KDS9E51, and it has this nice little window, which is probably made of silicon to pass the long wave infrared. Now, unfortunately, these markings didn't really return anything. However, after looking quite a while, I found this datasheet from Murata. I suspect that this is the device, just based on the wording that they use when they talk about the manufacturing technique. But we can see either way the sort of stuff that should be inside. There is down here a pyroelectric element, which has two pieces. And it's in this sort of configuration, which is exactly what other people say is inside these on the internet. So taking an old pair of side cutters to the silicon window, we can just break that and get one of the blades in and start cutting the metal can and just clear out the shrapnel and soon enough peel all of that back and here's the actual internals. And we can see that this is actually a ceramic hybrid module, which is exactly what that datasheet mentioned before about construction technology. So we can see there is this thick film resistor here, which is the same as in the datasheet schematic, as well as the pyroelectric element here. And of course it has three pins, and it's got a sort of matte finish on it. And it's rather interesting. Uh, it's sort of like a PTC device in its appearance, I guess, because, well, it is a piezoelectric device at the end of the day. Um, it's still rather interesting because, well... It's quite thick. Um, actually, it's. I don't really understand this though. It's, it doesn't really make any sense. It's really thick. I guess it must have really low thermal conductivity because, of course, there's very little energy coming in from the infrared. Um, actually, looking at this, this really doesn't make sense. Um, actually, where's the transistor in this? Um, there was meant to be a trend. Have I been lied to? Is what what is going on here? What's with these two pads here? There definitely was something. Wait a minute. This looks suspiciously like a upside down SOT twenty three transistor. Uh, let me get my spudger in here and brute force it open. 
And sure enough, we can see that there's a lead frame inside. And if we look a little bit closer, we can also see that, yeah, that's a silicon die. Yeah, this is an upside down transistor that's uh, definitely not a pyroelectric element. And these two solder joints are presumably where the pyroelectric device once was. I presumably broke it when I rammed that pair of side cutters right through the window and it, like a Neanderthal. So, uh, yeah, taking a look at the video. And yeah, whatever this white thing is here, that's definitely broken. And here again, yeah, that's broken. And I presumably uh, emptied that out into the bin. But fear not, because through the magic of buying another one from DigiKey, that's probably about the same, we have a second and third chance for me to screw it up again. But before we cut open this one, a quick intermission. Instead, I want to mention this. This is the smartphone that's recording this video, and it's also the one that recorded the last video about the Simpson washing machine. This is actually my everyday smartphone that I bought last year, and it's been pretty good for making these videos, as it takes 4K, well, uh, Sony advertises 4K, but it's actually not DCI 4K, it's some weird, sort of, not really, just barely 4K, that's uh, some weird 21 by 9 aspect ratio, so I just crop it to 1080p. But regardless of that, it was still a pretty good upgrade from my old smartphone from 2013, which was this here, Nokia Lumia 1020, which has an absolutely fantastic camera module. I mean, just look at the size of this sensor module. It is enormous, especially for a smartphone. Uh, it's 41 megapixels, so it takes fantastic photos. But because it's from 2013, the video quality is 1080p, 30 frames per second, just barely. And uh, it drops most of those frames. However, this and the new Sony phone have a number of limitations. For example, the aperture is fixed as well as there's certain software limitations like you can't really properly adjust the white balance as well as a number of software bugs that Sony does not want to fix for some reason. So I decided to go out and buy a little camera that I could properly adjust the settings on and this is it here. Well, okay, it's, it's, it's not a small camera, it's actually a professional full-frame camera but trust me I've got a good reason for this. And of course this is just the body of the camera. I also went out and bought a lens for it. Like, well, okay, I bought seven lenses for it. However, they take fantastic pictures, so it was worth it in my book. Now, I've actually already shown you some of the pictures from this camera. The previous PCB shots are actually from this year very fancy 300mm telephoto lens, which takes fantastic PCB shots, as you can see here on these PIR modules. And here's a very nice PCB shot of an old GeForce 4 card that I took for something else. But this here 90mm macro lens is the one that took all of the pictures of the PIR sensor that you're about to see. This lens is actually capable of one-to-one -one macro photos, so they're quite large and very high quality. It's, it's far greater than anything I would have been able to do on the smartphone. However, I decided that that macro lens partway through the video wasn't really going to cut it for some of the other pictures you're going to see. So one of the fantastic things about having a full frame interchangeable lens camera is that I can jerry-rig all sorts of adapters together to make this, which is a microscope objective on a tube extension as well as a E-mount. So this is what took all of the micro photos at the end of the video that you'll see. So I hope you enjoyed the improved quality of these photos. I certainly enjoyed them quite a lot. And another cool thing is that this channel actually regained its monetization. So YouTube has actually been giving me a cut of the ads you've been seeing on these videos now. And with that money, I actually went out and bought this SD card and this lens filter. So thank you to those who have been watching the ads. Although I don't recommend it because the ads are not worth your time, the money has actually been going somewhere other than YouTube's back pocket and presumably influencing my P-score. So enough with all of that talk, uh, let's get this macro lens on now and take a look at that PIR sensor module. So this here is the replacement PIR sensor that I bought off DigiKey. It's made by Murata, which is the same as the previous sensor. However, it's a different model, uh, just because this is the one that I was able to buy. 
Um, and well, it's pretty much exactly the same. It's about the same size. It's a same two element thing. So taking a uh, rotary tool grinder to this one this time, that way I don't have to break through the window. I can just grind off the top of the metal can and we can see that it's uh, glued in with this black glue. And then cutting into that even more, we can take all of that glue out and we can actually see now that piece of uh, whatever it is, ceramic piezoelectric material, as well as a FR4 PCB by the looks of it in this one rather than a ceramic hybrid. So cutting the rest of that off now and we can see, ooh, now, now this is the picture that I got the camera for. Check this out. This is actually not a single picture. This is actually uh, many pictures stitched together in a composite called a focus stack. That way it's really sharp, really nice. But I can make this picture even better. Check this out. There we go. Now it's good. So if I bring back that application note from before, we can have a read of it. We can see that the sensor uses a pyroelectric effect of a pyroelectric ceramic, which is a kind of piezoelectric ceramic, which is what this thingy here on the top is. The way this works is that when a human walks past, the thermal infrared energy heats up these little cells here, which causes a spontaneous polarization of the ceramic, which you can see here in this figure. Pretty much that just means that it creates a voltage differential between the uh, two electrodes of the sensor, pretty much like you'd see in the piezoelectric effect of certain ceramic capacitors, as well as piezoelectric speakers and vibration sensors. It's pretty much the same thing, however it's based on temperature, so it's pyroelectric. And as you'd expect, in order to be so sensitive to something as minuscule as the thermal energy from a human walking past, the thermal mass of this piece of ceramic has to be extremely low. So if we take a look here at this here telecentric photo side on, we can see that the ceramic element on top is extremely thin. It's actually 0.1 millimeters thick. So it has a decently good uh, response to uh, any sort of thermal energy, but it's still not as good as the micro balances in something like a micro bolometer that you'll see in like a thermal camera, but that's so much more expensive. Something like this is amazingly cheap and can be put into something like a consumer product. We can also see here that the element has two black rectangles, and that's because there's actually two separate pyroelectric elements here. And on the next page of the application note, we can see that it starts to talk about why the optics are so necessary for this thing. And that's because the lens at the front of this thing actually focuses onto two separate points, which is these two separate pyroelectric elements. And that allows it to sense movement much more easily at a much lower cost. It doesn't have to measure absolute temperature. It just has to recognize changes in the thermal energy when someone walks through the field of view in specific ways. And that's why before in the HPM uh, product information, we saw that they uh, took the time to explain to the customer how you should place it and in what ways it will be triggered. It won't be triggered when you walk away from the sensor, but when you walk across its field of view, it will trigger. And if we cut this PCB out of the PIR sensor, we can see on the other side that there's a transistor and two capacitors, and that's exactly what they said would be there in the product data sheet. And also, as you'd expect, because this thing is so thin, if you just take a pair of tweezers and poke at it, it pretty much breaks immediately. I'll also mention that there are actually different types of pyroelectric infrared sensors that can detect more different types of movements, like this here quad type pyroelectric sensor that has four of these elements and that can detect people moving across the field of view both sideways as well as up to down. So there are certain applications where you'd want to use this, for instance, on a ceiling. And whilst we're talking about infrared thermal sensors, I should mention that a pyroelectric sensor is not a thermopile sensor. 
A thermopile sensor is what you'd see in, say, one of those non-contact infrared sensors. And uh, to be honest, this is more comparable to uh, something like a microbolometer that I mentioned before that you'd see in a thermal camera. However, this is working on a completely different sort of theory. It's similar, but I have one of them, so let's take it apart and see what's inside. We can see here that the external construction is very similar. We have a metal can with a window on top. Presumably it's probably silicon. Uh, the sort of wavelengths are similar, but it probably doesn't have the uh, 5 micrometer filter. Maybe a different type of filter. So taking a big cut out of the side of this thing, we can see that there's actually a silicon dye inside here, not just a ceramic element. There's also another thing off to the right here, and the data sheet says that this is a thermistor which is used for getting the ambient temperature of the dye, and that's used for compensating it, which we'll get into later. And here we have a picture of a second one I cut open a bit more carefully, and this picture is actually taken on the microscope lens. This is again another composite, although this one I did quite quickly, so it's a bit screwed up in some places. But we can clearly make out this black square here in the middle of this silicon dye, as well as all of the connections that go to it although only two of them are actually connected to the outside world. So let's take a closer look at that. So here's another composite microscope picture of that, this time with the entire can cut off, and we can make out much more clearly that black area with all of the connections, although here I've actually damaged it a bit, and that was just by blowing on it with some air to clean it off, and that's because if we look closely, we can see that this black thing is actually suspended on all of these connections. This thing is actually floating in the middle of it, which, as you can guess, means the thermal mass of it is much, much lower than the previous piece of ceramic that was 0.1 millimeters thick. I don't know how thin this is, but I imagine it's a lot thinner. And taking an even closer look now, we can see all these individual wires going from the piece of silicon to this sensor region, they're all individually separate. You might think that these are just for mechanical support to suspend it in the middle. However, they're actually essential to how this thing works as a thermopile. To explain how this works, I have this here graphic from Shanghai Sunshine Technologies. And we can see that this thing is just made up of a whole bunch of thermoelectric elements. Just like a K-type thermocouple that has two dissimilar metals, this uses two dissimilar metal connections between the floating black area in the middle that's heated up by the thermal radiation from whatever you're pointing it at, and the actual silicon surround, which has a known temperature for cold junction compensation, which is derived from that thermistor on the metal body that we saw before. And, of course, the reason why there's more than just one junction is to get better sensitivity. And, of course, this black area here, although it just looks black, it's presumably some sort of very specialized material that's very absorbent to IR wavelengths as well. And that would increase the sensitivity as well. It also looks as if it has a sort of wavy texture to it. It's not completely flat. I would assume that this has something to do with reducing reflections inside the device, as that may influence the readings if certain angles were to cause reflections and increase the reading. We can also see these etching windows in the diagram. Uh, these are a undesirable thing. These are more just to facilitate the manufacture of the device. These actually result in the absorber area not being able to conduct heat through the substrate to the hot junctions of the thermocouples. So the shape and design of these is quite important for sensitivity as well. Also, just because we can't see them in the other one doesn't mean they're not there. The black absorber material on top of the substrate presumably is filling those gaps in. However, in order to see that, I'd probably need some sort of like scanning electron microscope. And yeah, I don't think I'm going to buy one of them anytime soon. Now, just to show you how thin this thing is, here I have a pair of tweezers. And just gently pushing on it, we can see that it just completely disintegrates. This thing is extremely thin. Just blowing on it too hard will cause damage to it. And taking the piece of silicon out now and putting it on the end of some tweezers, we can really see just how small this thing is. And turning it around, we can actually see the backside of it has been machined out, or I guess etched. Uh, 
I'm not really familiar with the exact principles of how this sort of MEMS device would be manufactured, but I can certainly appreciate just how cool it is that we can manufacture stuff like this, not only once off, but on such a scale that the average consumer can buy one of these for very little money. Especially when, a couple decades ago, this sort of technology would be considered black magic as something like this would be obscenely expensive to manufacture. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll just leave you now with some pictures I took throughout this project.